Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. When we think of dementia, most people automatically think Alzheimer's disease. But under a new definition of Alzheimer's, the two terms are no longer considered to be interchangeable. That is dementia and Alzheimer's. The most up-to-date definition is part of a new framework for researching Alzheimer's disease that the Alzheimer's Association and the National Institute on Aging developed and released this past April. Everybody's trying to make things more complex. (laughs) Or simpler. We'll find that out. In the new research framework, Alzheimer's disease is not diagnosed based on symptoms. Instead, it is diagnosed by its neuropathology, that is, the disease or abnormality in the brain. This is a shift in thinking. Symptoms are consequences of the disease and not the definition of the disease. Here to help us understand this new way of thinking about dementia and why it's important is Mayo Clinic radiologist and Alzheimer's researcher, Dr. Cliff Jack. Welcome to the program, Dr. Jack. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Dr. Jack, nice to have you on the program, particularly to talk about this topic because there are so many people who now have Alzheimer's disease. My question is, when you say neuropathology, that suggests to me that somebody looked at the brain under the microscope, and that's really not what you're talking about, is it? No, it's not. So um, by neuropathology, in this case, what we mean is that the diagnosis can be made biologically. So the term we use in the framework is biologically based rather than clinically based. And there are two ways to get to a a biologically based diagnosis. One is neuropathology. As you said, people look at the brain, they identify at autopsy plaques and tangles. The second way, uh, so that's good, but not helpful to living patients. Obviously. The second way is through biomarkers. And um, there are, at this point, fairly well-established biomarkers of plaques and tangles that can be ascertained in living patients. And those biomarkers fall into two general categories, one, brain imaging, and two, uh, proteins measured in suitable spinal fluid. And um, if I don't know if the discussion will take us there, but plasma-based biomarkers are obviously so, a hot topic people are working on. So blood. Blood, yeah. No. And we don't, we're not there, though. Uh, you can't make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's from a blood sample. Correct. But you can make the, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's through an imaging studies or a spinal tap. Exactly. Yeah. And and you're in the field of the imaging study. Yeah, I'm in the imaging area. And and so the brain imaging studies that can be used to make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, the, the diagnosis is a little bit nuanced, as is the neuropathology. So we on the NIAAA Research Framework Working Committee, you know, sought to reflect uh, with biomarkers what neuropathology has uh, done for years. So the diagnosis is a little bit nuanced. So there are two kinds of uh, pathologies that are necessary to make an autopsy diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, plaques and tangles. And so consequently, there are two different kinds of PET imaging studies that are needed to make a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in living persons. In living persons. <coughs> Amyloid PET, so a ligand that binds to and reveals the presence of plaques. And tau PET a ligand that binds to and and, uh, uh, reveals the presence of the tangles, neurofibrillary tangles. So those are the two imaging modalities. And then in the CSF area, cerebral spinal fluid area, the two kinds of proteins that are measured analogously are A-beta-42, a marker of uh, 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 plaques, and uh, tau, specifically phosphorylated tau, a marker of neurofibrillary tangles. So those are the accepted biomarkers uh, that are in use in research today, and that's how it, the disease would be defined in the living person. So what does that have to do, correlate that with what we, what we our intro said, is that the, you're changing the, the definition, so dementia does not equal Alzheimer's and vice versa. Right. So um, it is as just exactly as you stated in the intro. People both in, both in the general public, but also in medicine, most throughout most of medicine, equate the term dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And you can go back a little bit in history and see how that happened. So the initial uh, definition of Alzheimer's disease was put together by another panel, impaneled by the National Institutes of Health, 
back in the 1980s, the so-called McCann criteria. And the definition at that time was that if a person had a progressive cognitive impairment that, it, that progressed to multiple cognitive domains that led to loss of independence, after other things were excluded, that you would give a diagnosis of possible or probable Alzheimer's disease. Um, over time, the terms possible and probable just got dropped. And so people equated then a clinical syndrome, progressive clinical decline leading to dementia with Alzheimer's disease. Now, we know now <coughs> from research that's been done over the past few decades that that's incorrect. And what do I mean by that? It's incorrect in two ways. First of all, it's incorrect in the sense that there are other brain pathologies that either alone or in a combination can lead to dementia that looks exactly like Alzheimer's disease. What are they? Well, the common ones are something called hippocampal sclerosis, vascular disease, particularly multiple small strokes, Lewy body disease, which is the proteinopathy involved in uh, Parkinson's disease, and there are others. But it turns out that in people clinically diagnosed by experts um, with quote-unquote Alzheimer's disease, uh, on based on clinical grounds, about 30% don't have Alzheimer's disease. So why is this a problem? Well, it, it's, it wasn't really a huge problem until people started doing clinical trials that sought to uh, modify the underlying course of the disease. And when clinical trials were done, enrolling people on the standard clinical criteria, but those people were, there, were then examined with imaging, what was found was about 30% of the people enrolled in these trials and treated for Alzheimer's disease, didn't have Alzheimer's disease. Now, think of it. Can imagine a clinical trial for cancer where 30% of the people who were enrolled didn't have the cancer they were being treated of. I mean, it, it's unheard of, right? But that was the state of the art. And that is an explanation, one of the explanations that people in the field um, point to to explain a lot of these failed Alzheimer's clinical trials. So that's one big problem, and that is the clini classic clinical diagnosis is not specific for the disease after which it's named. There are other things that are common in aging that can cause an identical syndrome. The flip side problem is the fact that, again, this has been revealed by research over the past few decades, that the brain pathology precedes symptoms by up to 20 years. So symptoms classically used clinically de to define the disease actually are a late occurring event in the sequence of events that is the entire expression of the, of the, that constitutes the disease. So consequently, brain pathology appears well before symptoms. It can be identified by biomarkers. And if one would like to intervene therapeutically prior to the onset of symptoms, how can you do that? Well, there's only one way to do that, and that's to identify people who have no symptoms, but on the basis of biomarkers, have the brain pathology. And thus, uh, that w would be so-called secondary prevention, a secondary prevention trial. Think of any other area in medicine. That's the most effective way to treat, is to treat an individual on the basis of a biomarker evidence of underlying disease or underlying pathophysiology prior to the onset of symptoms. In every other area of medicine, that's how to do it. And again, if you go back to the, the definition, if the definition is, if, if there's no disease, quote unquote, until there are symptoms, then how can you prevent symptoms? <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, plaques and tangles, we don't need to know exactly what those are, but they're mm -hmm. things that you see under the microscope right. can, uh, are specific to Alzheimer's disease can, and can now be picked up in two ways, an imaging study that you would do or an examination of the cerebrospinal fluid, a spinal tap. Mm -hmm. All right, last question for this segment. Why does it matter? I mean, we don't have any way to, to even if you knew we mm -hmm. don't have anything, to, to any way to prevent it from progressing, right? Right. So, um, and the answer to that question is, today, it matters mostly to people who are doing clinical trials, 
designing clinical trials and for people who are enrolling in clinical trials. That's who it matters to. Mm. All right, we're talking about Alzheimer's disease with Mayo Clinic researcher and radiologist Dr. Cliff Jack. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about Alzheimer's research under this new framework. Where are we headed? You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We're talking with Dr. Cliff Jack. He is a radiologist and Alzheimer's researcher at the Mayo Clinic, and he has told us that there are now a couple of definitive ways to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, either through imaging with the brain or through a cerebral spinal fluid exam. And researchers are also working on being able to diagnose Alzheimer's with a blood sample, but we're not there yet. So the next question would be, who uh, ought to have this test? I mean, uh, um, maybe I'd like to know if my grandma has Alzheimer's disease. Should she get an imaging of her brain or a cerebral spinal fluid exam? Yeah, so th um, this is uh, an area where there's act actually active research, and there are, uh, there are sort of committees that are looking at appropriate use criteria for both of these, CSF, so cerebral spinal fluid, and brain imaging. And... I wouldn't say that the criteria at this point are fixed, are hard and fast, um, but I think most people, most people in neurology would say that if someone who has, so first let me preface this by saying, um, to, uh, to my knowledge, certainly the brain imaging uh, agents are, no one pays for them, so no insurer will pay for them. The FDA has cleared three of the amyloid PET ligands for, for fit for purpose. So the study is safe and it's answers safe. the question you want to answer, yeah. but. But no one pays for it. Hmm. Um, um, I think most people would say, for example, that if someone is symptomatic and if the individual and the family wants to know what the etiology is, because again, as we discussed initially, uh, someone who meets, who looks exactly like the classic clinical picture of what's called Alzheimer's disease doesn't necessarily have Alzheimer's disease. There are other things that can cause the symptoms. So if the patient wants to know, if the family wants to know, if someone who has is symptomatic has Alzheimer's disease, then that would be someone, if they could figure out a way to pay for it, to have the, to have the test. Much more controversial are, uh, is should these kind of tests be done in individuals who are asymptomatic but who are worried. They might be worried because they feel they have a memory problem, incipient memory problem. They might be worried because they had a, uh, a first-degree relative um, uh, who uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in life. Mm -hmm. I think that's much more controversial. I th most people would say that if you are worried but don't really have any symptoms, probably not. Um, I would say the field is probably evenly split on the second issue of if someone is, is clinically normal, but they feel subjectively that they have a memory, uh, worsening memory problem should they get tested. Because again, there's, there's no treatment that can alter the underlying course of the disease. The purpose of testing in these cases is just to inform the patient what is going on in their brain. But if anybody ever comes up with a drug that will prevent further deterioration in a patient with known Alzheimer's disease, you're gonna be really busy. Yes, so all these recommendations will change overnight. You know, which is one of the, which is a, a driving force for ongoing research into these biomarkers. Because the reality is, uh, the, it's an exaggeration, the minute, but really, the minute a, something is approved for as a disease-modifying treatment, everyone over age 65 or so is going to be asking their physician, I'm, I'm, who is concerned about it? who either has symptoms or is concerned about symptoms or is concerned about developing symptoms, I'm worried, I want to get tested, I want to get treated if I'm positive. And so developing and validating these tests for the disease, biologically-based tests, biomarker tests, um, even in the absence of an obvious intervention, effective intervention, is important to plan for, set the stage for the eventual clinical application. So, uh, yeah, so I just want to ask you, how much does this test cost? I mean, yeah, pet, pet is so, here, here's the, also, pet is expensive. A pet scan, uh, pet scan will cost, I think, about $5,000. CSF is much less expensive. That's but a spinal tap. Yeah. yeah, spinal tap is, 
much less expensive in the order of a few hundred dollars. But people are, in the United States at least, are not so excited. They're uh, a lot more am amenable to getting an injection in the vein and getting a scan than they are having a needle in the spine and getting a lumbar puncture. So those are the issues. The, the ultimate application, or let's say the ultimate uh, paradigm that people in the field envision is with the development of uh, sensitive, but not necessarily specific, but sensitive plasma-based or blood-based biomarkers that could be used to screen the population like a test for diabetes or, hi or hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and then individuals mm -hmm. who are positive and who met certain clinical criteria would go on to these more expensive and or invasive tests. But n neither lumbar puncture nor uh, brain PET is envisioned for mass screening at, uh, practically. And what got us started today is the difference between a dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And at this stage of the game, it's not important for patient treatment as much as it is the research. Uh, it's important to know for research purposes, which will eventually affect patient treatment. Correct? Do sure. I have that right? Okay, good. I'll make sure right. I understand this. Right. But is, so what research is underway here at Mayo Clinic? Right. So at Mayo Clinic, we have, there are, there are several kinds of research. So here in Rochester, we have two large cohorts of individuals. The principal investigator of both of these studies is uh, Ron Peterson. One is the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Center, and the second is called the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging. This is a study of people who are randomly selected from Rochester Olmstead County. They're clinically classified, clinically um, characterized extensively. They, those who wish, volunteer for brain imaging studies and cerebral spinal fluid. And this is the primary population here where we do these sorts of investigations that I mentioned, as investigations that I mentioned a second ago. How do biomarkers work? What are their predictive uh, uh, ability? Um, in whom would they logically be applied if and when treatments are uh, available? So this is a very valuable, very important study. It's actually the only study, to my knowledge, in the world where we have this situation where, ha where we have a random population-based sample. So people can't volunteer out of interest, and therefore we really see what biomarkers look like in an unbiased sample of the population. Um, but in whom we also do extensive biomarker phenotyping. To my knowledge, it's the only study in the world that has those really important characteristics for um, understanding how biomarkers work and eventually will be applied in clinical practice, when, uh, particularly when treatments become available. Well, here's what I think. I think we've got a new test for this uh, because I think if you were able to learn and understand everything that Dr. Jack has said, you don't have Alzheimer's <laughs> disease. <laughs> Dr. Clipper Jack, good. thanks so much for being with us. Radiologist and Alzheimer's researcher, Dr. Jack, thanks. Thank you very much for having me.